Well, good evening, everyone. It's good to be back here, and it is wonderful to get into the study tonight. I hope that you've enjoyed doing your homework and getting prepared. Um, ever since I knew that this was, quote, my topic, I've had, you, you guys you already know that music goes through my head all the time, <laughs> all the time. Well, this time it's to the praise of his glory, to the praise of his mercy and grace, to the praise of, the, of his glory, you are the God who saves. So you might hear that theme reverberating as we go into our study here. Um, and it's just good to share these, these insights with one another. A little preliminary, one of the uh, little pinpoints that we will um, get a hold of tonight is that on adoption. And you all know, I think all of you know, if you don't, you will after tonight, that this is very near and dear to my heart because I very proudly proclaim that I am adopted, I'm familially adopted and spiritually adopted, and it has been an absolute wonderful, wonderful journey. Um, from the time I was brand new until right now, uh, the last couple of years, it's been a special journey as I have um, met some bio soups for the first time on my mother's side. And uh, that has been a wonderful experience. Earlier this week, I met a brother on my father's side, which I had, I mean, this is two years after everything started. And it was like a little bit of, of, of fear and anxiety that uh, I returned his phone call. And um, as we, as we, Conversed, he comes up. He start. He tells me, "My name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Jesus has saved me." And uh, that just really blessed my heart to hear that. And uh, he's. Uh, we'll see where it goes from here. But you know, this this adoption just gives me a uh, great example of what God's adoption is for us. So that's just a little bit of a. a Preliminary, so I don't have to talk about it anymore as we go, go in and get a hold of my favorite words. Um, so with that, let's pray, and then we can get into our study. Father God, I thank you so much for these women that are here tonight. I thank you, Father, that we have come together to, be, uh, to share with each other what you have been teaching us this week what you've been teaching us as we've been studying the book of Ephesians, what you were, how you were leading us in our lives, Father, and just helping us to love one another, all in loving you even more and bringing you the glory, because God, it is for you, for the praise of your glory that, that we are here and uh, that we uh, just have the experiences that we have in uh, learning about you. Thank you, Father. Pray that you're with us on our study tonight. In your name, amen. Okay. Open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1, or you can follow along in the handout, whichever, um, all of the verses for these three chapters are written out in the handout, if you want to make notes on there. There is a lot of information in these three chapters, and uh, trying to figure out the best way to try to condense it is, uh, is a Herculean effort that only God can handle, so we'll see how... Um, these points come together. But our topic is redemption in Christ, redemption in Christ alone. And the background, just a little bit, um, Ephesians is uh, authored by Paul. As we know, he was an apostle. He was chosen by God, we know that. And this is one of his letters that he is writing from prison. He's writing to the church in Ephesus. And this could very well have been a letter that started in Ephesus and then circulated throughout all Asia Minor. So it may not have just been, may not have just targeted Ephesus. It uh, was more widely read than that. And again, as I said, it was written while he was in prison. Now the church in Ephesus was originally founded and started by uh, Paul taking a missionary couple to this uh, area, Priscilla and Aquila. And they're the ones that founded the church there. Uh, it is now, it's in modern day Turkey. And one of its distinctives was the Temple of Artemis or the Temple of Diana. And just for fun, I, want, I printed out a picture of it. That's what you have. 
in your handout is the, the picture of what uh, the temple looked like at uh, in Paul's day and what it looks like today. Um, it still is standing in ruins, but this is not a little temple. This is, I was quite surprised at the, the size of it. It was, it's classed as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. So that's why I had to look it up, just what is a wonder of the ancient world. And uh, they're all uh, uh, architectural features that are huge. So anyway, this temple is used as a temple for idol worship. It is, and this is the community that comes in to that temple. This is who Paul and uh, Priscilla and Aquila and Timothy are. These are the people in their community that they are um, serving. Timothy's role when he came in after Paul, Paul started and got the foundation for the church after uh, Priscilla and Aquila started it. Paul comes in, gives them doctrine, lays the foundations. But then the church started to kind of allow some of these influences from this temple worship to come in. And they were straying from the truth. They were watering down the truth. They were uh, bringing in new truth. And Timothy's role was to go in and to try to correct these truths. Um, there was a, a lot of a genealogical um, study that was going on, a lot of uh, myths that were going on, unscriptural ideas, uh, like uh, to be a Christian you had to abstain from certain fruit, certain foods. To be a Christian, you were, uh, they were forbidding marriage. These are people that could easily be classed as professing to know God. They'd say that they know that they knew God, but they denied Him by their actions. They really weren't following the one true God. So here's what uh, Paul's purpose is in putting this letter uh, to these churches. He's um, admonishing them for twisting the truth. He's encouraging them to get back to their foundation. He's reminding them of the immeasurable blessings that are found in Jesus Christ. And he's calling them, imploring them to come back to their first love. Reminds them of redemption in Christ. He reminds them that it's God that gives grace. He's challenging them to stand firm in the faith. And not only to just stand firm in the faith as it is, but to stand firm in the faith in the midst of evil. A lot of... Uh, tension and anxiety and stress coming in there. Remember, we're going back to, to Artemis and all of the um, idol worship there. Remember, 30 years after Paul uh, writes this letter to Timothy, John writes about them in the book of Revelation. And he says that this is the church that had abandoned their first love. So turn over real quick to uh, Revelation chapter 2. And beginning in verse 1, we read, To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but you have tested those who call themselves apostles, and are not, and you found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. Sounds like they're doing all the right thing, doesn't it? Sounds like they're doing exactly what God's called them to do. He said, but I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. I see a lot of parallels between Ephesus and what we face today in the modern 21st century. Is that the way to say it? Are we in the, we're in the, this is the 21st century, right? So we, we know the right things to do, but where's our love? And this is what Paul is, is encouraging. This letter is a refresher course in theology. It's bringing us back 
to the foundation of our beliefs, giving us a panoramic view of God's great salvation. And as we go through these bullet points tonight, remember, we're trying to get this really big view of salvation. So, grand view, an immense view. Dig in. Remember what it is that you first learned. Repent. Don't lose your first love. And remember that redemption is only in Christ and only in him alone. As I was studying through this, I came up with um, two key themes as I'm looking through these first three chapters. The first theme is the riches and fullness of blessings to the believers in Christ. These rich blessings, uh, our salvation and our redemption. We'll get into some of the key points in that. And the second key point revolves around the great mystery. Do you like mysteries? I'm so glad God gives us answers to some of his mysteries. So the first key theme, the riches of his grace, our spiritual blessings in Christ, our redemption. So in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14, you ready, set, go. God's redemption plan. His plan, we're going to look first at his plan in the past. In verse 4, in the past, he chose us before the foundation of the world. He chose us for himself. In verse 5, he predestined us. This is God's perfect plan for the destiny of his children. He adopted us. From a family apart from him, adopted us from a family of children of wrath and into his family. <clears throat> i got to say something about adoption here. I just can't pass it by. But human adoption, you know, brings us into a family. Um, and, that, and as part of that family, we receive all of the love and the rights and the resources and the inheritance of that family. But what that family can't give, they can't give their own individual characteristics, their own individual nature. My sister and I um, were both raised uh, together in the same family. We were both adopted from different um, families. And mom and dad raised us. They nurtured us. They loved us. They lavished themselves upon us. They uh, invested their lives in us but they couldn't make us into the people that they were specifically. But when we are redeemed, when we, be, when we are adopted into God's family, we receive the very nature of God himself in us. Our adoption is completed in Christ. We not only receive his blessings and his, his riches and his blessings, but we have his nature, all that he is, his power, his authority. So that's redemption in the past. Redemption now. In verse 7, it says that he redeemed us through his blood, through his sacrifice on the cross, the forgiveness of our sins, and that's only because of the riches of God's grace which he lavishly heaped upon us. He extravagantly gave us his grace. His death on the cross paid the price required to purchase us out of sin, we were doomed for God's wrath, but by his grace, we are redeemed for his glory. Mark and I have been reading through um, the Old Testament together, and one of the things that has just really, really jumped out on me, uh, jumped out to me, is how God dealt with rebellious people that were opposed to him, that were either disobedient to him or that, were, that chose not to follow him, and he was not gracious with them. To read about the wrath of God in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, the way that he uh, extinguished uh, civilizations, had the earth swallow people up. Um, but it's just, um, we were reading, I was reading about uh, Shechem and how they went through and um, God allowed uh, the whole, he knocked them out, he killed them all. And it's that wrath that we deserved that God has saved us from through Jesus Christ. It's that wrath that was laid on the shoulders of Jesus on the cross. It's that wrath that is, 
that, that is what Jesus saved us um, and giving us our redemption. Romans 3, verses 21 through 24, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That's the redemption that's available to us now. And then God's plan for redemption in the future, starting in verse 10, says that it was planned for the fullness of time, planned for eternity, planned for what God has in store for us at the end of the age. He's to, he will unite all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. Verse 11, he says that we have an inheritance because of our redemption. We have, his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and to godliness. He called us to his glory and into his excellence. He's given us his precious promises so that we can become partakers of his divine nature. We can partake in everything that he is. This is our inheritance. And what do we have that will guarantee that? God, we know that God doesn't go back on his word, but he's gone even a step further. He's given us the Holy Spirit who is the seal of that inheritance, the seal of our redemption. We've heard the truth, the gospel of our salvation. We believed in him, and when this happens, the Holy Spirit comes into our life and preserves our salvation for now, and he preserves it for eternity. We are sealed. The seal signifies security and authenticity and ownership and authority. And the Holy Spirit is given by God to us as a pledge of the believer's future inheritance in glory. So Paul is loving this church. He has invested his life in the church, his heart, his soul, his love. And in spite of the difficulties that they are going through, in spite of the challenges of trying to remain true to the word, he thanks God for them. And he um, starts out with his prayer in verse, uh, verses 15 through 23. He acknowledges the church and he acknowledges their reputation. In spite of the challenges, Paul knows where their heart is. They're just really struggling with where to keep their heart. And he acknowledges that they had faith in the Lord Jesus. And he acknowledges that they have a love for all the saints. I love Paul's prayers. We get to go through two of them tonight. This is the first. In verse 16, he says he prays for them without ceasing, always giving thanks and remembers them. Every time he prayed, he thought of them. How often do you think of our church family here? How often do you pray for our church family? How often do you pray for specific individuals in our church? How intentional, how deliberate, and what an example Paul is to us of praying uh, unceasingly, always remembering us. This really convicted me as I read this part of the, of the scripture tonight, of just um, the responsibility that we have to be able to, the responsibility and the joy that we have to be able to remember one another in prayer. And when you get into your small groups tonight, when I ch my challenge is share some ideas as to how maybe we can help one another to do this more effectively. I mean, obviously we're not gonna pray for every person every day I mean, we have 27 grandkids. That's a lot to try to remember. You add that by, you know, multiply that out. That's lots of people to pray for. We could be praying all day long, every day, and it would be wonderful, wouldn't it? But we do have other responsibilities, too. But we can do a better job at doing it. Um, what were the types of things that Paul prayed for for the church there at Ephesus? He prayed in verse 17 for a spirit of wisdom to be intelligent, to fear God. We know from Psalms that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. In verse 18, he prays for them to be enlightened in spiritual truth. 
They have discernment in knowing him. Keep their eyes focused so that you can see and understand what God is calling you to. Verse 19, he prays for the exceeding greatness of his power. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead and seated him in the heavenlies, exalted him up into heaven, is the same power, it's part of God's nature, the same power that resides in us. Verse 20 to 23 reads, He raised him from the dead, seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So we just talked a little bit about our redemption, past, present, and future, and what does that do for us? Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 10. In verse 1, we read that we were dead in our trespasses and, uh, trespasses and sin. And what does it mean to be dead? That means that you're dead. You're not uh, capable of doing anything for yourself. Have, and when, we're, when we were in that dead state, we had a total inability to know God, and we had a total inability to please God. We had our minds set against God. We had our minds set to go the ways of the world and the course of the world. We read in 2.2. We were children of wrath. We were unregenerate. We were condemned before God, just like everyone else. But God... Chapter 2, verse 4, is rich in mercy. He gives compassion and pity on those he loves in spite of our sin. And in verse 5, we read that he made us alive together. It's a supernatural act of regeneration, which is binding and preserving, as we read about what the Holy Spirit does when he comes to seal us. And these redemption facts fast past, present, and future make us who we really are today, who, who we are that God designed us. We are, according to verse 10, we are his workmanship. We are not a mistake. God did not make a mistake in, in designing us, in creating us, no matter how you got here, no matter what your abilities or disabilities are. It's not a mistake. God has a plan for you. We were created by Christ Jesus. We were planned the way that we are. We were planned before the creation of the earth. And we were planned to walk in good works that God has created for us to do. These are what we read in verse 10. To walk in the plan that God has created for you. Our responsibility before him is to seek him, know him, and walk in him. The second theme, the mystery. The mystery of the gospel. Anybody know what it is? What's the mystery of the gospel? What's that? That, it's, that, the, that redemption, salvation is for the Gentiles also. The Old Testament um, saints had no idea that... Um, that they weren't the only privileged group that was going to have salvation available to them. The mystery is that the Gentiles are the same as the Jews. There is no distinction in their being able to partake in the promise of Christ in the gospel. All are equal as children. That's the great mystery. That's what the church teaches. That's what we believe. That's who God is. He, he wants all to come to him doesn't matter. The Gentiles, according to um, chapter 2, verse 11, they were separated. They were uncircumcised. They didn't have the mark of being uh, Jewish. They were alienated. They were strangers to the covenants of the promise. They had no hope, and they were without God. And there was a wall of separation, and that wall was referring to the wall that was in the uh, the Jewish temple that separated the court of the Gentiles from the uh, area of the temple where the Jews could enter. But God made them into, made us into one new man 
neither Jew nor Gentile, but Christian. He reconciled in verse 16, both of, both of us to God, both Jew and Gentile to God, making peace, both as one, not hostile, but friends. He killed the hostility, putting to, get, putting to death the enmity, the death of Christ on the cross, killed the hostility between a holy God and a sinful people. In verse 19, it shows that he says that he made them all members of the household of God. Redemption brings us all into God's family. And redemption gives us a dwelling place of God. Now, after Christ enters our life, if that's where the Holy Spirit is, no longer in the temple, no longer in the Holy of Holies, but residing in us permanently in his body in the church. In chapter 3, verse 6, it reads that all may partake of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. The mystery is that people who have never heard of God and those who have never heard of him all their lives, whether you have heard of God as a child, whether you heard of God on your, on your deathbed, whether you were redeemed in midlife, no matter where in your life's walk you were redeemed, we all stand on the same ground before God. We're all equal. The message is accessible and it's welcoming to everyone across the board. The young and the old, every ethnicity, every tribe, every nation, everyone gets to share in the grace of God in redemption through Jesus Christ. I pray that the world would really come to realize that that's what the church teaches, that we are in all inclusive, that we desire for all to come to him, not just whoever we feel that is deserving, because none of us deserve salvation, but uh, God in his grace has extended it to us. Chapter 312 says that there's, we have boldness and access. We have faith. Our faith in an all-sufficient Savior makes us acceptable to God. We can come before him. We have his power and his strength to be bold. We have access to him. We can come before his throne. In order for God to receive the glory he deserves and for which he created us for and to find fulfillment and purpose for the reason he created us, we need something first for that. We need to ask God to illuminate our hearts and to motivate us. We must not only understand his truth, but we must be divinely enabled to live out our salvation. So understand and by action so that we're not accused as the church in Ephesus was of knowing God, professing to know God, but by actions uh, they were denying the relationship with God. And then the last portion of today's scripture is the second prayer of Paul that we get to encounter. And this gives us a glimpse of the kind of rich existence that is possible when we are filled with the fullness of God. This is the kind of prayer we need to be praying for one another. This is a great example of how, you don't know how to pray for somebody? Just pray this for them. First off, Paul submits himself to his father. He bows his knees as a tender and compassionate parent who welcomes and invites us to come to him. Paul prays according to the riches of his glory, God's limitless riches of his power that are available to every believer. He prays that they would be strengthened with power through his spirit. In the inner man, the person that you really are, that that's where the strength and power would be. He prays for Christ to dwell, to take up residence in our hearts. He prays that we'd be rooted and grounded in love. He prays for the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, the love of Christ beyond all knowledge. He prays to be, that we would be filled with all the fullness of God, totally dominated by him. And then he concludes his prayer with now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us 
To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. He gives us, the, he has the power, the resources, the nurturing, the love to do more than our wildest imaginations can possibly. So a whirlwind walk through chapters one, two, and three. But there's got to be a takeaway, right? There's got to be something to, to grasp onto, to hang on to. I'll share my takeaways. Um, you might come up with some different ones, but this is what I got from these three chapters. I was encouraged to continually admonish and remind one another of our immeasurable blessings in Christ. Let's focus and help each other to remember what those blessings are, what the blessing of redemption means, what the blessing of being created in the image of God means, what the message, what the blessing of um, not being a mistake, what the blessing of being able to live up to the strengths and the power that God has given us through his indwelling in us. Let's remind us each other of that. Remind each other of our redemption and salvation. Remind one another that God gives grace. Um, quick little story. Uh, I was talking with Matthew last night, and uh, in our conversation, he reminded me of an incident that happened that I was very uh, directly involved in 25 years ago. And at the time, and up until last night, I believe that I fully handled that situation 100% right. That there was nothing the matter with the way that I uh, dealt with it. And Matthew made one little comment, and all of a sudden I realized, God, I really blew it back then, didn't I? And all of a sudden I'm remembering that situation, and I'm overwhelmed by the pain and the hurt that I caused someone. But God gives grace. I went to him last night and said, God, I can't do anything about it, but you can. You can forgive me, and I pray that you will help heal the hurt in this individual that I, that I hurt from, the, from my words and from my actions. God gives grace not only for the moment, but he gives grace day by day, every step of the way. We just need to claim it. Remind each other of that. Challenge us, challenge one another to stand firm in the faith. Not all, and checked especially to stand firm in the faith in the midst of evil when you were the only one left standing. Continually, deliberately, intentionally pray for one another until the day that we see Jesus, until the day that we stand before him face to face. This is what it means to be the body of Christ, and this is what we can do for one another. This is all to the praise of his glory. And remember, redemption is in Christ alone. You have to go to the song. You can't go through this passage without going back to the song. <laughs> to the praise of your glory, come praise and glorify our God, the Father of our Lord. In Christ he has in heavenly realms his blessings on us poured. For pure and blameless in his sight he destined us to be, and now we've been adopted through his Son eternally. To the praise of your glory, to the praise of your mercy and grace, to the praise of your glory, you are the God who saves. Come praise and glorify our God who gives his grace in Christ. In him our sins are washed away, redeemed through sacrifice. In him God has made known to us the mystery of his will, that Christ should be the head of all, his purpose to fulfill. Come praise and glorify our God, for we've believed the word, and through our faith we have a seal, the Spirit of the Lord. The Spirit guarantees our hope until redemption's done, until we join in endless praise to God, the three in one. And Father, this all is to the praise of your glory, to the praise of your mercy and grace, to the praise of your glory, because God is you are the one who saves. We thank you, Father, for your salvation. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your cleansing. 
I thank you, Father, that we can come to you, that we have access to your throne. Father, help us to be mindful of the strength and the power that lives within us through the Holy Spirit. And Father, I pray also that you would help us to be mindful of how we can support one another and uh, in be encouraging as we live these uh, these days in a world, Father, that is becoming coming further and further from you. I pray, Father, for your strength. I pray for a commitment to learning you more. I pray for more of a commitment to your word so that we can stand up, Father, when the times get tough, we can stand up in the midst of evil. Thank you, God, for your love. Thank you that you're with us here tonight. I pray that you be with us as we go into our small groups. We love you, God, in your name. Amen.